Stanford University. Do we want to get back into our favorite subject, supersymmetry? Well, I started it, and I'm going to finish today by really showing you the mathematical structure of supersymmetry in four space-time dimensions. We did it a little bit with just time. And then I'm going to show you how quantum field theories are constructed, just give you an example of the construction of a supersymmetric quantum field theory and show you what the supersymmetry gives for the Feynman diagrams and how the Feynman diagrams uh, uh, work a little bit. This is for a simple model supersymmetric field theory. It is not the most general supersymmetric field theory. It's an example. Uh, more general examples sort of follow a very similar pattern. OK. Um, the simple example that I showed you only had one direction of space-time, and it was just time. I completely ignored space. And for example, we wrote down relationships between the super generators, the Qs, and the Hamiltonian, the energy. But the energy belongs together with the momentum in a single four vector. How can it be that there is only a relationship which involves the energy or the time component of the momentum on the right-hand side? Mustn't there be some generalization of that with more Lorentz invariance, where what's on the right-hand side of the anti-commutation relations involves not only energy, but also momentum? And the answer is yes, it must be. The equations have to transform in a sensible way under Lorentz transformations. All right, to, to, uh, to get a bit of a feel for it, although not in uh, great detail, it's good to go back to the Dirac equation. But the Dirac equation in a particularly simple situation, if the, uh, if the Dirac particle were massless, it would have two components which would be uncoupled, namely the left moving, the left, uh, the left and the right spinning uh, fermion. Left and right spinning means relative to the direction of motion. Okay, my right hand screw and left hand screw. There would be two of them, and, and the electron, of course, does have two components, like uh, two uh, a left hand and a right hand uh, partner. But if the particles were massless, you could have a purely left-handed particle that did not have to have a right-handed particle associated with it. Do you know why that's true? There's an interesting reason why massless particles can have the property of only spinning in one direction, but a massive particle has to be able to have two spin states. And the reason is kind of simple. Um, let's suppose we had a massive particle which could only spin to the right. Now, to the right means right hand rule. So it has momentum, angular momentum, twisting around to the right. All right? It's, moving, it, it's moving along. But now I decide to move faster than it. It's spinning this way, but it's moving that way. The original one was spinning right hand and moving along my thumb. If I'm going to be moving faster than it, it's now still spinning the same way. I, uh, it's left-handed. It's left-handed. So a massive particle, because it moves slower than the speed of light, you can always outrun it and look at it, and a left-hand particle will become a right-hand particle. So you've got to have both. You can't just have left-handed particles. But if a particle is massless and truly moves with the speed of light, then there's no way to turn a right-handed twisting one into a left-handed twisting one. You can try a Lorentz rotation, which rotates it all the ways around, but that takes a right-handed one. If I, just by virtue of rotating my arm around, it doesn't change my right hand to my left hand, okay? So particles which move with the speed of light can be monodextrous. I don't know what the right word is. Actually, I do know what the right word is. The right word is chiral. Chiral means 
spins only in one direction. Uh, the word chiral, C-H-I-R-A-L, refers to having a handedness. And I think, what's the Greek word for hand? Chiron? Well, it comes from, it comes from the Greek word for hand, which is chiro, chiros, or chiron, or... Is this helicity? Yeah. Closely related to helicity. It is helicity for a massless particle. It's not quite helicity for a massive particle. Actually, it, it, I think it is helicity for what you just described. It's chirality. Well, I think chirality is the thing. It depends on who you read, but it's the thing that's associated with the gamma matrix. Yeah. Helicity and chirality are a little bit different. Chirality has to do with gamma 5. Helicity has to do with sigma dot p. I'm going to explain what sigma dot p is in a minute. And it's only for massless particles that gamma 5 is equal to sigma dot p. So they're not quite the same thing, but, um, but in the case of a massless particle, they are. OK. So a massless particle has half as many states spin states as a, mass, as a massive particle. The Dirac particle describes the massive electron, for example. And the Dirac field has four components. The massless particle, the massless chiral particle, let's say left-handed. It's um, standard to, to, to think about left-handed particles. Those particles, or the fields, the wave fields for those, the, the Dirac-type fields, have only two components. And they're called psi 1, a two-component spinner, psi 1, psi 2, which we can also write psi alpha. And they satisfy a Dirac-type equation. The Dirac, I'll write down the Dirac-type equation. It can also be called a Pauli equation. It has no mass in it. and it looks like I d psi dt. Oh, well, let's, let's start up here first. There's a Hamiltonian for the particle, and the Hamiltonian is sigma dot p. What does that mean? It means that if it's spinning in the same direction as its momentum, then its energy is positive. If it's spinning in the opposite direction of its momentum, its energy is negative. But there are no negative, uh, negative energy particles. There are no negative energy particles. We can replace them by holes and fill up the sea of negative energy particles, all that stuff. So um, left-handed particles have sigma dot p being positive. OK. Now, you can convert this into a wave equation. H is, of course, I d by dt. P is minus I d by dx. There are three x's, but I'll simplify it. Minus I d by dx equals, put an equal sign here. And there are three components to x here. So this is x, y, and z, and sigma are a set of three matrices, the three Pauli matrices. So we can put them in here, minus i sigma. And this really means sigma x d by dx plus sigma y d by dy plus sigma z d by dz. We can even write it as just sigma dot d by dx. And all of this acts on psi, psi, psi. And that's the analog or the simple version of the Dirac equation. We can shift this to the other side and write that I d psi dt. And now let's call t x naught, the time component of a four vector, d psi by dx naught plus sigma dot d psi by the x, x now means x1, x2, x3. Sigma has three components. This x over here has three components. That is equal to 0. 
And now we can even make it a little bit simpler by defining a fourth Pauli matrix. The, th the ordinary three Pauli matrices, they are 1, minus 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0. This one's the Z, the Z component, this one's the X component, and the last one is 0 minus I, I. That's the Y component of uh, Pauli matrix. Let's add one more, the time component of the Pauli matrix. Right? The time component is really simple. It's just 1, 1, the unit matrix. There are four of them. These are enough matrices to write any matrix as a linear expansion in them. Now there's a 1 multiplying this. This is just 1 multiplying beside the x. So I could put here the fourth. This is x naught, the time component. I could put here sigma, oops, sorry, sigma naught. And this whole thing becomes just i, sigma mu, where there are now a four vectors worth of sigmas, times d psi by dx mu equals 0. That's the, um, the chiral Dirac equation. And it's perfectly Lorentz invariant. It takes a little bit of work to truly prove that it's Lorentz invariant. But it really is Lorentz invariant. And these size transform, the, tra the size here transform in a particular way under Lorentz transformations. We don't need to write it down. All we need to do is to know that two component spinners like this have a distinct and simple transformation property under Lorentz transformation. All right, that suggests, and now it, it suggests, and it gives the right suggestion, that the Grassmann parameters, the Grassmann parameters, which are also the size, first of all, are anti-commuting objects. Did I leave something out here? Psi d by d, I don't know what this was. Um, since psi is a quantum version of a Grassmann number, an anti-commuting field, it suggests that the Grassmann algebra consists not just of a theta, but a theta alpha, just like psi. Also, the complex conjugate, theta bar alpha, which is theta bar 1, theta bar 2. How many independent components are there altogether of these? There are four. We can either think of two real, two real and two imaginary components, or we can just think of the thetas and the theta bars as separate objects. That's OK. It's, it's legal to just think of them as separate objects. Uh, but if you want to be uh, a little more precise, you can think of the four real components of theta as being um, uh, right. So there are four components of theta. Now, supposing we have a general function of theta, for example, a superfield, a superfield which depends on the coordinates of space as well as these new anti-commuting coordinates, we can, we can again expand it in powers of the thetas. It will start out, for example, if it were just a, uh, a bosonic uh, object, an ordinary number, it would start out with some ordinary thing which was independent of the thetas, might depend on the x's. And then there would be something proportional to theta. For example, we might call it psi bar theta. There might be something with a theta bar in it, plus theta bar psi. How far would it keep going? Previously, we ended it at the next term. Why? Because there were only two thetas. But now there's going to be more. And it's going to go all the ways to the fourth power. Why? Because there are four thetas. 
Right. After the four thetas, they'll start repeating, and uh, that'll be the end of it. So we can go to what I'll call, uh, either I can call it sometimes psi bar squared, psi squared, or uh, sorry, theta bar squared, theta squared, times some coefficient here, often called the uh, d term. Um, or I can just call it just theta to the fourth and make it simpler. But theta to the fourth doesn't mean the, four, the fourth power of anything. It means theta. It means the product of the four distinct thetas. Okay. So I'm going to use simplified notation. In many cases tonight, I'm going to use simplified notation because the indexology gets awful. So I don't want to do it tonight. I want to uh, simplify it. Okay. So now we can ask, what is the super algebra? Uh, what is the analog of the, of the anti-commutation relations and the commutation relations of the Qs with other, with themselves and with other things? I will write them down for you now. You've seen things like it before, but now there's the new added kick that things have indices alpha. All right, so there's going to be a Q alpha. Q is also a spinner. It belongs to the same family of objects as theta. And it begins with d by d theta. Oh, I don't want to do that. I'll do that later. I'll do that later. Let's uh, cut that for a minute. Q is an object which belongs in the same class of things as theta. Let's just uh, think of it that way. And let me write down now what the commutation relations are. I want to write the anti-commutation relations. Anti-commutator of Q dagger alpha with Q beta. Beta and alpha don't have to be the same. Okay. Let's try to figure out what that is, what that could be, what possibly could be. Remember in the previous case, what did I have on the right-hand side? Remember? Twice the Hamiltonian, right? All right. So whatever goes on the right-hand side, is something like a Hamiltonian. Hamiltonian means energy. And energy is a component of a four vector. There is a two there. The two is a purely conventional. Uh, th there's no significance to it. You could normalize it differently. On the right-hand side, we should expect that there is a p mu. In the previous case, p mu just meant p naught, the energy. Right? But you can't have a Lorentz invariant theory where you have some structure here with just a time component. If you do a Lorentz transformation, that time component will turn into space components. So you better account from the beginning for a p mu here. But that doesn't look good. There's no mu on this side. There's an alpha and a beta on this side. There's a mu on this side and no alpha and beta, so it means we haven't written a sensible expression. We need something else in here. We need something to soak up this index alpha and give us an index alpha and beta. What could that be? Sigma mu alpha beta. Sigmas are matrices, but they also have an index mu. So we can make a nice formula out of this, sigma mu alpha beta. Now both sides match in all their indices. Mu, uh, of course, this means sum over mu, Einstein convention. All right, so we now have a potential possible Lorentz invariant anti-commutation relation for two supercharges, q dagger and q. We can also write this as, let's see, 2i sigma mu alpha beta d by dx mu. I'm using the connection between components of momentum and derivatives, derivative operators. All right, both of these are correct. Next, the anti-commutators of q dagger with q dagger. any two components. In the previous case, it was 0. It remains 0. Same as q, q 
Q. And the other thing that we have, I'm going to write 0 in a minute, 0 equals. For any alpha and beta, for any alpha and beta, uh, we had that the supergenerators commuted with the Hamiltonian. That made them time independent. That made them conserved quantities. Here, the generalization is they commute with all four components of the momentum. I'll just write P, and I won't bother writing which component. Any Q with any P, and it's also any Q dagger with any P. All of those, oh, sorry, uh, when you have a Grassmann variable and an ordinary thing, you use commutator. 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 And what about the commutation relations between different components of momentum? They commute. Why do they commute? Because they're represented by derivative operators, derivative with respect to x, derivative with respect to y. Their order of differentiation doesn't matter. So all components of momentum commute with all components of momentum, including the time components. This is the thing which generalizes to a Lorentz invariant theory the thing that we called the superalgebra last time. OK. Any questions? Is that the alpha beta on that sigma, is that the matrix index? Yeah. OK. So alpha and beta are the matrix index, and mu is the space-time index. And you see, we needed it in the formula because we had to soak up the index mu somehow, and we had to put back in an index alpha and beta. Now there's a concept, again, of superfields. I'm not going to write out the components of the superfield, but the superfield is a function of coordinates, thetas, and theta bars. And it's the role of the Q's and also the P's to differentiate phi, to shift it, to make little shifts of phi with respect to x and with respect to theta. For example, the action of P on phi is to multiply it by i times the derivative with respect to x. The action of Q In the same way that P is, uh, depends on which upper or lower components, but let's just write it as i d by dx. In the same sense that P is i d by dx, Q, Q alpha, is almost just d, well, it's not almost, but it's d by d theta alpha. So Q is like a, a component of momentum in the theta direction. Now the theta direction is this infinitesimally small direction. What it means to have a momentum in that direction is not something you can conceive of, but we're not quite finished. It's the same deal as last time, add plus i. Remember what we had last time, theta bar d by dt is what we had, or theta bar, theta bar d by dt, now it becomes Theta bar beta, I'm going to put all the ind indices in, but after that, I'm going to simplify. Uh, d by dx mu. Theta bar. theta bar. Theta bar, d by dx mu. This is the analog of theta bar times d by dt, but this doesn't look so good. There's an alpha on this side. Uh, there's a beta on this side. That doesn't look good. Then there's a mu here with nobody to soak it up. We need a sigma. All right, so the sigma will be sigma mu beta alpha. That's Q. And I'm going to rewrite that. I'm going to simplify it and just write it as d by d theta plus i theta bar 
sigma d mu. Just to save myself writing these indices over and over again. Okay. The sigma is here to give the thing the right alpha beta structure, but also to soak up there should be a mu here. But I'm going to simplify it. I'm going to get rid of all indices in the expression. D means derivative with respect to x. This, differ, this curly D means partial derivative with respect to x. Which x? The one that matches the component of sigma here. OK, so that just, this is just written in shorthand. Q bar alpha is equal to d, or I guess I'm going to write q bar beta just for variety, d by d theta bar beta plus again i sigma mu beta alpha theta alpha d by dx mu. Again, hmm? Th no, no, this one's theta. If this one is theta, this one's theta bar. If this one's theta bar, this one's theta. They're conjugates of each other. Or more simply, d by d theta bar plus i sigma theta d. All right, for shorthand. Those are the Q's. Now, what do the Q's do? The Q's operate on superfields. And they give you the small change in the superfield under a supersymmetric transformation. In other words, the variation of phi uh, is or is it's Hermitian. Here they are. Oh, yes. this one, they're all symmetric except for this one. I think I wrote it right. Uh, beta on the left. I think I have it right. I'm saying sigma mu in the second equation. Mm-hmm. I believe it's beta alpha. It's beta over here. Yeah. Beta over here. Alpha alpha mu. I think I have it right. OK. The, a supersymmetry transformation really just means a small change in the superfield, which is given by either Q times a superfield. Now, what does Q times a superfield mean? It simply means you hit the superfield with these various derivatives. Or Q bar times phi. That's a comma here. You can do supersymmetry transformations with q. You can do it with q bar. Think of q on phi as a small change in phi. Mm -hmm. That's the role of what the, uh, now we could, we could go through. We could take a superfield and expand it out into components. Components simply mean the coefficients of the various powers of theta. When people speak about the components of a superfield, they're talking about the coefficients of the various powers of the thetas. We could work out what the changes are in each component, but I don't want to do that. That's, that's not useful for right now. Right now, I just want to follow the bookkeeping and show you how the, uh, the manipulations work. OK, so that's, that's uh, good. All right. What is the simplest superfield? The simplest superfield, you might think, is a general function of the x's and thetas and theta bars, all of them. But might there be something simpler, which depends on fewer variables, which is still a good superfield in a sense? Could there be some constraint? Could there, could there be a possible constraint that you can impose on the way that phi depends on its arguments, 
which simplifies, which gives a simplified superfield, which is still has good supersymmetry transformation properties. So let me give you some examples. Supposing we're talking about rotation invariance. Here's a bad idea. Take a vector field and say, I'm interested only in vector fields which satisfy Vx equals zero. That's not invariant under rotation. And I would discover it by making a rotation of the vector and discovering that after rotation, what's the change? Well, just two dimensions. What's the change in the x component of a vector under a rotation? It's proportional to the y component. So, and if the y component is not equal to zero to begin with, then after the transformation, the x component won't be equal to zero anymore. So in a rotationally invariant theory, you don't want to impose a constraint like Vx equal to zero. Bad idea. OK. How about the constraint V squared equals zero? This means Vx squared plus Vy squared. Well, that's a, that's, that's a very, very strong constraint, isn't it? That just says V is equal to zero. This, that's, let's, let's make it V squared equals one. Is that a consistent constraint in a rotationally invariant theory? Yes. It's just the length of V, and you've set it equal to 1. Now, it may not be a useful thing to do in any realistic uh, field theory, but it's perfectly invariant under rotations. How do you check that it's invariant under rotations? You do a small transformation under rotation, and then you see if the resulting components of V satisfy the same relationship. If they do, you've done something that's consistent with the symmetry. OK. Let's ask whether there's an interesting constraint that you can apply to a superfield to decrease the complexity of a superfield. Not to decrease the complexity of an already complicated one, but some constraint which would give you a subset of things which might be simpler than the most general thing. This is simpler in the sense that it is less, instead of having two independent components, it only has one independent component in two dimensions. So v, if v squared is equal to 1, it has only one independent component. All right. Um, I'm going to guess. Question? I'm going to make the guess. Now, of course, it's not a guess. I know the answer. I didn't work this out. Somebody else worked it out. That there is a constraint that you can impose, that you may impose on a superfield, which has the form of some differential operator, which I'm going to call d bar times phi is equal to 0. D bar is a differential constraint, a set of derivatives and a set of uh, differential operators on, on the superspace. What is the condition that this be a consistent thing to do which commutes or which, uh, which is consistent with the supersymmetry? All right. Suppose I impose such a constraint. I haven't told you what d bar is yet. I'm going to tell you what d bar is. But supposing there was a constraint like this, then it must be true that if you do, if you make a small variation of phi by hitting it with a q, it must be true afterwards also. In other words, it must be true that d bar on phi plus the small variation of phi, which is proportional to q times phi, must still be equal to 0. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a consistent thing to do consistent with the supersymmetry. Well, I'm thinking of d as a linear operator of some sort. So d phi we already know is equal to 0. We're assuming d phi is equal to 0. And the question is, if d phi is equal to 0, Will d bar 
If d bar of phi is equal to zero, will be d bar of q times phi equal to zero? I haven't told you what q bar, d bar is. This is an abstract general question about what kinds of constraints can be consistent with a particular symmetry. All right, now this says d bar on q is equal to phi. Suppose it were true that q, which is after all, which is a Grassmann number type variable, supposing q either commuted with or anti-commuted with d bar, in either case, we could write this as plus or minus q d bar times phi. But we've already agreed that d bar of phi is equal to 0. So therefore, this would also be equal to 0. So it's a sufficient condition for a constraint to be supersymmetric that the constraint operator, the differential operator of constraint, either commutes or anti-commutes with the symmetry generator that we're talking about, in this case, q. So what does that raise? It raises the question, are there any differential operators which commute with both q and q bar? If there is such an operator, then we can impose a constraint and possibly make the superfield simpler. A constraint like this would say that the superfield depends on its variables in a particularly special way, and it may have fewer dependent variables than you expect. Now, this is really not that complicated. I'll tell you what d bar is, and you can check your. Q d bar phi. I just switched the order of Q and d bar under the assumption that Q and d bar either commute or anti-commute. If they commute or anti-commute, you can switch the order and then use the original constraint on phi to say it will be true both before, trans before variation and after variation. All right, there's a very simple answer for a d bar and a d, which both anti-commute with both q's. I'll show you what it is, and you can check. We'll do a little bit, but I'll, I'll, I'll show you what it is. d bar alpha, or let's, d bar beta, excuse me, is exactly the same as q bar with one exception. Anybody care to guess? Hmm? The sign, minus i, sigma mu, beta alpha, well, let's just simplify it, minus i, sigma theta, times derivative. Same exact expression that I have here, except with the i changing the sign. If you go through it and check whether it, let's see what it, uh, whether it anti-commutes or not with, uh, with uh, these things. <coughs> d by d theta bar anti-commutes with theta bar to give a, basically a 1. So when I anti-commute this with this, I'll get this piece of junk over here. On the other hand, when I anti-commute theta with d by d theta over here, I'll get the same thing. The minus sign here will cancel it out. Believe me, you can check it. Uh, in fact, um, <laughs> Michael, you've already checked this sort of thing in the simpler case, right? Exactly the same thing. This object anti-commutes with both q and q bar. The same happens to be true also of d alpha, which is d by d theta minus i uh, theta bar sigma derivative. But I'm only going to be interested for today in one of them, in one of them. And I'm going to say, what kind of constraint, what sort of simplifications will be made on my superfield if I insist that it have a very special property, namely, d bar on phi is equal to 0?
You can't both do D bar and D. If you did D bar and D, that would say that phi was equal to zero. But let's just take D bar on phi equals zero. I'm going to tell you what the answer is. Well, first of all, this would be a constraint on the components of the superfield. It might eliminate components of the superfield. It might simplify the superfield. Okay? I'm going to give you the general solution of this equation. The general solution of this equation is that phi, phi of course depends. What does it depend on? It depends on x and theta and theta bar. But the answer is that it depends on, let's see, um, let's see what q bar is. You know, for, let me take a, let me do something simpler first. Supposing that d bar was just d by d theta bar without this over here, what would it say to say that d by d theta bar on this gives zero? It would just say that phi doesn't depend on theta bar. That's all. It would just say phi is a function of x and theta. But it's more complicated. This condition that d bar on phi equals zero means that phi depends on a theta bar in a special way, in a particularly simple special way, and I'll tell you what it is. It says that phi is a function of x mu plus i theta bar sigma mu theta and theta. In other words, it only depends on the peculiar combination x plus i theta bar sigma theta. It doesn't depend independently. It doesn't have an independent um, variation with respect to theta bar. The only way it depends on theta bar is through this combination. That's what this equation says. Let's check it. Let's see if we can check it. <laughs> Okay. It doesn't quite say that phi only depends on theta. It says it depends on theta bar in a particular way that comes in together with x. Well, let's just check it. I'm not here. All right. Um, Let's differentiate this with first with, res with respect to theta bar. What happens when you differentiate this with respect to theta bar? You get a derivative with respect to this argument here. In other words, a derivative with respect to x times i sigma theta. Is that clear? That the derivative with respect to theta bar of this is equal to the derivative of phi with respect to x, I'm simplifying it now, times the derivative of this variable with respect to, I'm sorry, the, the derivative with respect to theta bar, is derivative with respect to x times i sigma mu theta. I've just done standard calculus operation of differentiating with respect to this variable here by differentiating with respect to the whole thing and then finding the derivative of this whole thing with respect to theta bar, and that's that. On the other hand, the other thing which comes in is minus i sigma theta derivative with respect to x. But that exactly cancels this. So you see, any function of the special form phi of x plus i theta bar sigma theta and theta is automatically annihilated by d bar. That's all this d bar says. d bar, or d bar equals 0 says. It says that this has a particularly simple form. Um, another way to say it is to call this whole variable here y mu, everything under here. 
And then it says that phi only depends on phi of y and theta bar. So theta. No independent dependence, no independent dependence on theta bar, only through y. That's the meaning of this. And the meaning of the whole set of ideas here is that you can have a superfield which has this simpler dependence, and it still is a representation of the supersymmetry algebra. It still transforms uh, in a coherent way under the supersymmetry algebra. A field like this, which has only this dependence, is called a chiral superfield. It's called a chiral superfield. So this is a, incidentally, chiral superfields are always complex. They're not real things. They are generally complex. And the way you can show that is you can see that a small variation of the chiral superfield by hitting it with a Q gives it an imaginary part if it didn't have an already imaginary part. So a chiral superfield is also a complex superfield, complex in the sense of uh, complex numbers. It's a complex thing, but that's a, that makes it a little more complicated, but it only depends on theta bar in a particularly simple way. Now, I, you know, I, this is a sort of unending story of, um, of formal manipulation, but after a while it gets kind of fun to do the formal manipulations and to see how they work. So let's do the next formal manipulation, which is to start calculating a Lagrangian for phi, for the superfield capital phi. Oh, before we do, let's just see what this says. This says that let's expand phi. Phi might be some scalar, ordinary number object which depends on y. And what comes next? Next comes plus psi bar times theta. Psi bar can depend on y and theta. Have I left anything out? How many components of theta are there? Two, right? Remember, it's a spinner, an upper and a lower component. That means you can have theta squared, which really means theta 1 times theta 2. So you can have plus a thing which is always called f times y. I'll call it theta squared, but it really means theta 1 times theta 2. I could start adding things with theta bar, but this says no, no theta bars. Theta bar dependence is all in y. No theta bar dependence except what's in y. So the superfield, the chiral superfield, has a limited, much smaller number of components than the general superfield. It makes it simpler. It's the simplest example of a superfield. And it only has three independent components. Phi, a fermionic component, in other words, a fermion field, a boson field, a fermion field, and then what looks like another boson field. We're going to find that F is not really an independent boson field, but let's uh, keep going. Yeah? Uh, you have, you have uh, x in that uh, longer equation. And then you wind up with y, which is orthogonal to x. No, no. Y is. That, that, OK, why is that? x mu plus i theta bar sigma mu theta. Definition. Definition. It's not x and y. It's, uh, yeah, right. Just y. I've just used the term y to denote this particular combination. And once I work with y, the superfield just terminates after the second term. That's a good thing. It makes it simpler. However, y is not x. And after all, what we're really interested in is how things vary with x. So at some point, we're going to have to translate back to x. 
Okay. Let's talk about Lagrangians. Lagrangians begin with super Lagrangians, which I think the last time I called lambda. Ordinary Lagrangian, I'll use the term L. And these Lagrangians depend on theta, theta bar, and the x's. An ordinary Lagrangian would only depend on the x's. And what do we do with it? We compute an action. Ordinarily, the action is an integral of the Lagrange density, the Lagrange density over the four directions of space. So we do have that, d4x, but also now integral d theta, d theta bar. Now, how many components of theta are there? Two components of theta, so this can really be read, read d2 theta, which means d theta 1, d theta 2, and d2 theta bar, a four-dimensional integral over the four components of theta. That's the action. If we do the integral over theta first, then we get left with something which doesn't depend on the thetas anymore and is just the ordinary, F, the ordinary Lagrangian. So that's our goal, is to construct super Lagrangians which have supersymmetry, and then to do these integrals and find out what kind of ordinary field theory we're talking about. Okay. It turns out that the Lagrangian is a Lagrangian. The construction of Lagrangians in this context is really quite simple. Simpler even than the things that we talked about last time. This is even simpler, and I'm going to give you some examples of some Lagrangians and then show you how they lead to Feynman diagrams. As I said, the degree of abstraction is, is really unusual. Uh, you just have to follow your nose, follow the equations, and in the end will pop out something fairly recognizable. The end of all of this will be a fairly recognizable structure, a Lagrangian for a fermion and a boson, some interactions, some Feynman diagrams, but it will be guaranteed to do certain things that only supersymmetric Lagrangians do. And we'll talk about those things. OK. So let's take the Lagrange density big lambda and expand it out in a power series in theta and theta bar. It will have many terms, the last of which will be proportional to theta, theta, theta squared, theta bar squared, or theta 1, theta 2, theta 3, theta 4, or theta 1, theta 2, theta bar 1, theta 2, theta bar 2, all product of all four independent thetas. When I do the integral over all the components of theta, it will simply pick out only that last term. Right. So the rule is very simple. You construct Lagrangians with all this crap and all sorts of higher powers of theta, but in the end you pick out only the last term. It sort of sounds stupid, but it's very efficient and very clever the way that it works. So let's do a simple example. I'm going to take a very simple example. It seems, too, it seems too simple to be interesting, but let's take it anyway. Let's take for lambda, uh, not theta, sorry, the superfield, the chiral superfield phi times its own complex conjugate. Now that really seems much too simple. Incidentally, let's write down what the complex conjugate is. Um, the, uh, OK. I'm going to erase this. But I'm going to write down what the complex conjugate is. The complex conjugate of the same thing is 
the complex conjugate superfield, but it depends on the complex conjugate variable, x minus i theta bar sigma mu theta and theta bar. Just complex conjugate everything everywheres. Complex conjugate phi, complex conjugate the coordinate that it depends on. It depends on this peculiar complex coordinate here. And instead of depending on theta, it depends on theta bar. That's the complex conjugate. Let's multiply those two together and then see if we can, what kind of Lagrangian it gives. OK, so what does phi depend on? Phi depends on x minus theta bar sigma theta, i theta bar sigma theta, and theta bar. That's phi star. And we're multiplying that by phi, which is phi of x plus i theta bar sigma theta, and just plain old theta. And what are we going to do with it? We're going to integrate it over the thetas and also over the x's. d4 theta, all components of theta. Well, before I do any integration, this is the action. This is the action. Before I do any integrations, I want to shift the x-coordinate. I just What happens in an integral is an integral of a function. What you're doing is calculating the area of the function. What happens if I just shift the function? If I shift, this is a function, this could be a function of x, but I shift the function f of x plus anything plus a. Does the, does the integral change? No. So you can shift the argument of a function of x without changing the integral. But I must consistently shift the argument x. If I shift it here, I must shift it the same way here. I can't possibly shift away both the i, th this th thing, and this thing, because one of them appears with a minus sign, and one of them appears with a plus sign. But I can shift away one of them at the expense of the other one. So supposing I shift the x-coordinate by shifting away the dependence over here, what happens to it over here? It doubles. It doubles. We're going to let x get shifted by this amount here. And when you do so, this will get doubled. Let's see if I, plus 2. And now we can get rid of it over here. You don't have to do this, but it, it's simple. This is a trick. This is a trick which is unnecessary but simplifies the calculation a good deal. OK, now let's plug in. Now we have to do some work. All of this up till now has been just formal manipulation. It's still formal manipulation. But now we're going to do a little bit of work. We're going to write not a lot of hard work. We're going to write that phi is equal to a boson field plus uh, psi bar theta, psi bar theta, plus f theta squared. But that's as a function of y. In other words, as a function of x plus this thing here. I want to write it as a function of x. So let's see what I have to do. I have to Taylor series expand in powers of the thetas here to exhibit precisely how the thing depends on theta. So let's do that. Let's start with this phi here, which is a function of this variable. We can write it as phi, phi of x. This is phi of y. Everything depends on y and y. But y, oh no, 
What am I doing wrong? It's not y. It's just whatever this thing is. Y was just x plus i theta bar sigma theta. This is x plus 2i theta bar sigma theta. Let's not call it y. Uh, I could call it y prime, but I won't. All right, so this, is, this begins with phi of x. That's just a bosonic piece of phi. Next, we have to differentiate with respect to x d phi by dx. This is just a bosonic piece here, d phi by dx times the amount that I've shifted x, which is 2i theta bar sigma theta. Then there's another term, which is the second derivative with respect to x. I'm going to simplify notation and just call this the second derivative with respect to x squared of phi times this thing squared. I'm not going to bother writing out that thing squared. I'm just going to notice that it contains two powers of theta and two, po two powers of th theta and two powers of theta bar. There's only one expression that contains two powers of theta and two powers of theta bar. It's the product of all four components of theta. Anything else will have redundancies. So let's just call this theta to the fourth. And I'm not going to bother keeping track of the numerical coefficients. The next term in the power series expansion of little phi here, little phi is the bosonic piece of big phi will contain higher powers and will contain more powers of theta and therefore will be 0. So that's the end of the expansion of the first term in the superfield. The next term in the superfield involves psi bar of x times theta. But I have to add to that the derivative of psi bar with respect to x times the shift here, which is this, again, this 2i theta bar sigma theta times theta. We had psi bar of x times theta. Then we, sh then we differentiated psi bar with respect to x and multiplied by this. Let me simplify and just write this as theta, theta, theta bar. It has two powers of theta and one power of theta bar. Let's just get rid of all the crap and just write it as two powers of theta and one power of theta bar, just to be schematic. I'm being schematic now. Oh, didn't we write that down? Well, we did someplace, but I guess I erased it. I wrote down that phi of y is equal to little phi of y plus psi bar theta of y plus f theta theta. All right. Now I'm shifting the argument of, I'm writing that y, not this y, I'm writing that this object over here all right, is x plus this amount. So that means I have to shift the phi, and I shift the phi by doing a Taylor series expansion. This one ends at theta, theta, theta bar. If I try to add another derivative, I will have too many thetas and it will kill it. Okay? I'll have three powers of theta or something, at least three powers of theta. So nothing after that. And then there's f plus f theta squared. Do I have to start Taylor series expanding this? If I Taylor series expand this, it will give me a derivative of f times theta sigma theta. That's too many powers of theta. So I don't have to do anything with this. This is just f of x. Now everything depends on x. We have th one, two, three, four, five, six terms coming from expanding out in the Taylor series expansion, the x dependence, but truncating it when I get two higher powers of theta. So 
Which one? Yeah. Oh, sorry, yes, theta squared, thank you. You're sharp. Over here, I don't have to do very much. That's this on the, in one bracket, and in the other bracket, not so hard. It's just phi star, little phi star, the bosonic part of x, plus uh, theta bar psi, theta bar psi, I think. Theta bar psi of x plus f star theta bar theta bar. I don't have to do any shifting in this one because it's only a function of x. I've undone the shift in here by, you know, and, and stuck it into here. Okay. Now the trick is to multiply, all, <laughs> it's very complicated looking, but remember all we want out of it is the last term in the expansion, the theta to the fourth. So let's see what's there to order theta to the fourth. Let's start with phi star here. Well, phi star has no thetas, so I have to find something with theta to the fourth in it to multiply it by. Here's the only thing with theta to the fourth in it. So there's going to be one term, which is phi star of x times a second derivative of some sort, x squared phi. Now, later on, we're going to have to integrate this with respect to x. Does this look familiar? It's the Lagrangian for a scalar field. It's the Lagrangian for a scalar field, ordinary Lagrangian for a massless scalar field. OK? So we went through an enormous amount of effort to get the Lagrangian for a scalar field. Now, let's see what else is here. Uh, let's take this one here. Let's, that has to multiply two thetas and a theta bar right over here. So that gives us something with two thetas, two thetas and a theta bar. That gives us plus something like the psi bar with respect to x times psi. Now, this isn't quite sensible. There's an index alpha and an index beta and an index mu. So what really has to go here had I kept all the indices? Sigma matrix. Sigma mu, alpha, beta. Guess what this is the Lagrangian of? It's just a fermion-Lagrangian that gives the Dirac equation when you work out the Euler-Lagrange equations for it. This one gives the Klein-Gordon equation when you work out the variation of it. And I'm not keeping track of numerical constants because uh, I've long ago uh, learned not to do that on the blackboard. And one last thing is here, is f star f of x, f of x. Now, boson, scalar boson, Dirac-like fermion, and something trivial. This thing is extremely trivial. It has no derivatives in it. In fact, what would its equation of motion be? It would be partial derivative of the, this is the Lagrangian now. This whole thing here is the ordinary Lagrangian or the integral of the ordinary Lagrangian. If I have a thing with no derivatives, just like this, what's the equation of motion for it? It's just the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to f equals 0. There is no derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to the derivatives of f. There's just dl by df equals 0, or f star is equal to 0. f star is equal to 0, f star and f are complex conjugates, F is trivial. It doesn't do anything. It has no interesting equation of motion. There's another way of thinking about it. Um, we can think about it in terms of propagators and uh, in terms of uh, Lagrangians, of course, lead to Feynman diagrams. The kinetic terms in Lagrangians like this just lead to the propagators. This guy over here is going to give us a perfectly conventional propagator 
for phi. Nothing going to be unusual there. Phi is going to have a propagator which propagates from one point, whatever the ordinary scalar field propagator is, this is what we'll give it. This is going to be a perfectly conventional fermion and we'll also have a conventional uh, propagator. But what about this over here? This is a little bit trivial, more than a little bit trivial. There's no derivatives in it. There's no derivatives in it. And that means that if there were a particle associated with this, that particle would not move from one point to another. There's no term in it which couples neighboring points of space. It would give a propagator. That propagator would be totally trivial. I'm going to draw a picture for it. I'll tell you what it, the, the propagator would not be zero quite. It would be something a little bit le a little less trivial than zero. Let's draw it like that, a little uh, squiggly line from one point to another. But does it really propagate from one point to another? No. So you care to guess what it might be? It's a delta function. The particle, come, the, the particle, which is not really a particle, comes in and goes out at exactly the same point. It doesn't get anywhere. So the propagator for, the, for this very, very simple Lagrangian with no derivatives in it is just a delta function. The propagator begins and ends at the same point, and the particle can't get anywhere. That's the structure of the Feynman propagators that come out of this term in the Lagrangian. Now, this in itself is not an interesting Lagrangian. I mean, it's, an, it's mildly interesting. It has a boson and a fermion, exactly as we expect for a supersymmetric theory. They're both massless. The particles have no mass, and they have no interactions. OK, no interactions. So let's go on to interactions. Let's go on to interactions and see if we can find some interesting Feynman diagrams out of this. We took phi star times phi. Notice something very, very interesting here. The super Lagrangian didn't even have any derivatives in it. The super Lagrangian itself was just phi star phi. It uh, was extremely simple and didn't have any derivatives of the superfield. Where did it get its derivatives from? It came from the fact that we had to shift the argument of the superfield. Okay? If it wasn't for that shift, we never would have generated any interesting motion of the particle from one point to another. So supersymmetry does something interesting. It takes an extremely simple Lagrangian or, or super Lagrangian which seems to have no structure to it, uh, propagation from one point to another, but because of the shift of the argument, the shift of the argument of, uh, of x there, it really does shift particles from one point to another in space. OK, let's add something else simple. Instead of phi star phi, let's add in just a phi squared, and while I'm doing that, I'll also add in phi star squared. But that's just the, com the complex conjugate of phi squared. So if I figure out what phi squared does, I will also have figured out what phi star, uh, just the complex conjugate will be this one here. So let's concentrate on this. Just plain phi squared, what does it do? Okay. All right, all we need to do is to square phi. Let's square phi, but before we do, Remember what we're going to do. We're going to integrate this d4x, and also we're going to integrate it with respect to theta. Okay? But something interesting or simplified happens here. Simplified compared to here. This is, this is capital phi, the superfield. Capital stands for superfield. All right, let's remember what we have. We have capital phi of x plus i theta bar sigma theta and theta times another phi of exactly the same kind. <coughs> uh, 
Remember what I did over here. I started with phi star times phi. I knew that I was going to integrate it with respect to x. So I shifted the x integration. I shifted x. I shifted x to get rid of the, uh, the theta dependence here. But what did it do with here? It doubled it over here. How about in this case? What happens if I shift the argument x to shift away theta bar sigma theta over here? It does it in both places. In fact, if this were any power of phi, not with, without any phi stars, if it was any power of phi with no phi stars, it would just shift it away everywhere. This one's pretty simple. Let's write it out. Oh, oh, oh. But now we have a problem. We have a problem with the theta integrations. d2 theta, d2 theta bar. There's no theta bar dependence here. What happens if I integrate d theta bar against something with no theta bar dependence? You get 0. You get 0. So on the face of it, this looks like 0. But the fix for it is very simple. It turns out to be a completely supersymmetric thing to do when there's no theta to par dependence at all is to just integrate over theta. That needs to be justified. That needs to be justified that when you have a Lagrangian or a function which doesn't depend on theta bar at all, just integrate over theta and you still maintain the supersymmetry. As I say, that needs to be justified, but let's assume it's justified. This is the thing that you do when there's no theta bar dependence at all. Let's, what, what that means is that we should expand things out to power theta squared. And it's the theta squared term which will give us the answer, the Lagrangian. All right, and let's put an m here. Let's put an m over here. m theta squared integral d4x. Let's see what we have here. Phi. M phi squared, excuse me. Phi of x, that's small phi of x, plus psi bar theta plus f theta squared. And we're going to square that. Let's just write them side by side. The only way I can square things is to write them side by side. Plus psi bar theta plus f theta squared. And what we want to compute is the term in this which is proportional to theta squared. Okay. What do we get? Well, first of all, we get phi times f twice. Phi times f over here and f times phi over here. So there's a term without keeping track of the constants which will look like f times phi. There will also be the complex conjugate, because we're supposed to add the complex conjugate, but just will be f times phi. That's one thing. And there's only one other term. Can you spot it? Psi squared. Psi bar squared. Psi bar, psi bar. Psi bar, psi bar. Oh, sorry. No, that's it, I think. Yeah, that's it. That's it. That's all there is from this term in Lagrangian is f times phi plus psi bar psi bar. OK, first of all, let's look at the Dirac part of it. It's m psi bar psi bar. That's a mass term for the Dirac particle. A mass times a product of two psi's with no derivatives is a mass term. It's called a Majorana mass term. It's a rather different, slightly different mass term than the kind we've thought about in the past. But it is, it's, a psi comes in and a psi goes out and there's a coefficient m. It is, when combined with the, um, with the conventional piece of the Dirac-Lagrangian here, it gives rise to a wave equation which has a mass. 
So this is a mass for the Dirac particle, for the fermion. But this m f phi looks a little peculiar. It's not like anything we've seen before. But if we think about it for a minute, it will make a Feynman diagram in which a phi particle, the dotted line, becomes an f. Now, an f, let's just draw that f with that little f propagator there. Well, that's a phi becomes an f. For a phi becomes an f, an f is a nothing. It doesn't do anything. It just sits there. But you can have a Feynman diagram to second order where the f becomes a phi again. That will involve m squared. This term in the Lagrangian f phi gives you a transition from a phi to an f. But an f is not a real particle. It doesn't go anywhere. So you better get back to phi. That will involve two powers of this interaction, an m squared, and it'll give us a phi in and a phi out. In other words, it's completely indistinguishable from having m squared phi squared in the Lagrangian. m squared phi squared is just a mass term for the boson. We can do this another way. We can do it in a more, uh, in a more uh, sophisticated technical way without diagrams. Let's look at everything in this Lagrangian which depends on the f's. First of all, we have f star f. And then we have plus m f phi, and also the complex conjugate, m f star phi star. Well, as I said, f occurs in this awfully trivial way in this Lagrangian. Its equation of motion is just gotten by differentiating this with respect to f and setting it equal to 0. There's no derivatives. So the equation of motion for f is just f star plus m phi equals 0. And uh, uh, that's the equation of motion for it. OK. Let's solve this equation of motion for f, f star equals minus m phi, and then plug it back into the, uh, into the Lagrangian and see what we get. Well, what's f star f going to give? f star f, oh, f star, what is f? f is equal to minus m phi star. f star f is going to give m squared phi star phi. All right, m squared phi star phi. What about m phi f? That's going to give minus m squared phi star phi. They cancel. But there's one more left over here, and that one is also m squared phi star phi. So that's another way. You can either think diagrammatically that what this f thing here does in a Feynman diagram is give something which is indistinguishable from m squared phi squared. Or you can solve for f, plug it back in, and you see that the effect on the Lagrangian is just m phi star phi. It is also a mass term for the boson. And in fact, the mass of the boson is exactly the same as the mass of the fermion. Remember, in boson equations, you write m squared. In fermion equations, you write m. Uh, so the fermion and the boson both get a mass. And in both cases, that mass is just m. Again, we see this power of this symmetry taking place, making sure that the boson and the fermion have exactly the same mass. The power of this really becomes significant. We could have just done this by taking a boson field, a fermion field, and giving them the same mass. Right. And they would be free field theories, no interactions. Their masses would never change. There would be nothing very interesting. It would be supersymmetric. The power of it, though, 
is when particles interact. So let's go one step further and add a third, another term in the Lagrangian, g times phi cubed. Now, phi cubed is more interesting. <coughs> d2 theta, same game, but we have to put one more phi plus psi bar theta plus f theta squared. And let's see what kind of things we get from here. Remember, we're looking for the coefficient of theta squared. That's all that counts in the Lagrangian is the, is the theta squared term. So let's see what we can find. We can find a phi uh, let's see, we can find a phi times a phi times an f. So there's phi times phi times f. How many terms like that? Three terms like that, right? And then there's a term involving, we can have phi times psi bar times psi bar. Phi times psi bar times psi bar. So that's phi times psi bar times psi bar. How many terms like that? I think there's also three, is that right? I think there's also three. Now, first of all, all times g, all times the coupling constant g. G is a coupling constant. Well, what is this term, phi psi bar psi bar? It's an interaction in which two fermions come in and one boson goes off. Or a fermion comes in and a boson goes off. In other words, it corresponds to a diagram with two fermions and a boson. And it has a coefficient g. It's an interaction. It's going to create a lot of complicated Feynman diagrams. These Feynman diagrams will become endlessly complicated. What about this one over here, 3 phi squared f? OK, 3 phi squared f, let's, uh, let's forget the 3. The 3 is not the interesting thing here. It gives us a g with two phi's and one of these f propagators here. You're not allowed to have an f in the, the ending on nothing. There's just no particle associated with it. You've got to connect it up to something else. What you, the only other thing to connect it up with is another version of the same thing. There's a vertex where two phi's become an f, and there's a vertex where an f becomes two phi's. What is this? What kind of thing is this? Remember, the f doesn't go anywhere. It just really just corresponds to a local vertex where two phi's come in, two phi's go out from the same place. In other words, it looks like phi to the fourth, or really it's phi squared times phi star squared. It's a Feynman diagram with four bosons coming in at a vertex. And it has a g squared. Where did the g squared come from? Because there were two vertices. One where the two phi's became an f, and one where the f became two phi's. All right, so this thing got repeated twice, and it's got a coefficient g squared. Notice the really the interesting thing here is we could have written down exactly these kind of things. What has the supersymmetry done? It has made the particles have exactly the same mass, and it has related numerically the value of a one kind of coupling constant, two fermions and a boson, with another coupling constant, which is four bosons. And in fact, it's told us that this vertex and this vertex, that this vertex is the square. The coupling constant is the square of this one. That's a tight constraint. If you could do experiments with these particles, you could check by scattering, by decays, and so forth, whether the uh, Feynman diagram for two bosons coming in and scattering 
is the same as the Feynman diagram for two fermions to come in and produce a boson. That's the kind of thing that supersymmetry always does, gives you equality of masses and relationships between different coupling constants. Now, just before I finish, let me just show you simply, without actually doing any calculation, but just what the implications of relationships between coupling constants like this are. We've talked about it before, but let's, uh, let's go through it carefully. Let's think about the self-energy diagram of the boson. Here's one self-energy diagram, it's sort of the lowest order. And another one is boson becomes a pair of fermions, which become the boson again. This is what you can make out of these vertices here. The 5 fourth vertex, that's over here. Four phi's at a vertex. And here's phi psi times psi. What's the numerical coefficient that goes with this one? g squared. What's the numerical coefficient that goes with this one? Also g squared, a g from here and a g from here. Now, the rest of the calculation, of course, involves some calculation of the integrals for Feynman diagrams and so forth. Uh, but uh, you can imagine now that we uh, carried that out. I'm just showing you that the coefficients are the same. The integrals are also the same. The integrals are also the same. And this persists to all orders. Every Feynman diagram, no matter how, co no matter how complicated, which may also have fermions in here, there's always a collection of other Feynman diagrams which have exactly the same value except for the opposite sign and which cancel out. The opposite sign, you'll remember that fermion loops and boson loops have the opposite sign. So this kind of construction, while it's rather tedious, long-winded, and, uh, and you know, just takes uh, forever to explain, has a tremendous amount of power if your goal is to write down theories which have exact supersymmetry. Supersymmetry meaning a boson-fermion exact uh, symmetry. Now, uh, I think we are finished with the mathematical formalism of supersymmetry. I am personally entirely sick of it, and I don't want to see it again. <laughs> but we still have some things to finish up, some strings, so to speak, to tie up. One of them is the breaking of supersymmetry. Supersymmetry is not a real symmetry of nature. And how that may happen, what it does, how it shifts particles around. And the other thing is the idea of unification, unification of the forces, and how it's influenced by supersymmetry. I think we have one more class, is that right? Oh my god, you're kidding. Two more? Oh. Uh, all right, so we will talk a little bit about the spontaneous symmetry breaking of supersymmetry, what its implications are, what it says about the particle spectrum, and then we'll talk a little bit about the unification of forces, SU3 cross SU2 cross U1, the standard model, becomes SU5, and how it is influenced by the supersymmetry. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.